Bueno, muy buenos días a los que se están sumando en este momento. Los saluda Horacio Matarazo, presidente del comité, y voy a este, dar lugar a esta este, segunda charla de nuestro cronograma de 12 horas de transmisión. Cada charla va quedando grabada, la vamos a subir a YouTube y además queda acá en Facebook en forma fija y ya permanente. Bueno, esta segunda charla eh, en inglés va a estar a cargo de Alex Fletcher. Eh, Alex es un joven y fanático observador de aves, también biólogo formado en Inglaterra, él es inglés, eh, es un poquito inglés, un poquito sueco, y este, después de vivir un tiempo en Australia, él se radicó en África eh, para formarse como guía de observadores de aves, guía de naturaleza en general, y, pero bueno, en, ha sido cazado, cazado con Z, por una argentina que se lo trajo a Argentina y actualmente está desde hace un tiempo trabajando como biólogo y como eh, guía de observadores de aves aquí en Argentina, es parte del equipo de Buenos Días Birding eh, y hoy va a dar al mundo una charla en inglés eh, presentando a Argentina. Igual habla castellano, así que le pueden hacer la pregunta en el idioma que quieran este, el que quieran, castellano, inglés, sueco, francés, chino, lo que quieran le pueden preguntar qué le entienden. Eh, y bueno, Alex, bienvenido, y puedes ya compartir tu presentación, no la estás compartiendo ahora. Eh, esto siempre la feria, todas nuestras ferias tienen un poquito de informalidad, así que, bien, ahí está. Bueno, ahora sí. Quedamos en tus manos. Adelante, Alex. Gracias, Horacio. Muy buenos días a todos y a todas. Eh, bueno, es un placer estar acá, aquí, en mi primer, bueno, en mi primer eh, feria de aves. Y uh, bueno, mucho gusto conocerles a todos. Y bueno, les pido disculpas porque sí, hoy eh, voy a estar speaking English. Uh, so hopefully it's a good practice for those of you who, uh, who maybe are learning English or who know a little bit. And for those who don't, well, you can enjoy the photos. Uh, there will always be photos and I'll try to keep everything as clear as possible. Uh, that being said, I am going to try and talk about mm, the whole of Argentina in, well, I have about 50 minutes. So we're going to, well, we're going to try and rush through it and get everything done. And hopefully you're going to learn something. And, and really, we're going to look at Argentina, um, not just in, in terms of its birds and of its birding sites, and birding hotspots, as you can call them. Uh, but we're going to be looking uh, a little bit at the geography of Argentina and we're going to try and understand why there are birds in certain parts of the country. And we're going to look at it um, in terms of a, as if perhaps you were a tour operator or you were planning uh, a visit to Argentina and you were working on an itinerary. So hopefully this presentation is going to make some of that more simple for you because it's going to explain Uh, where you have to go to find certain birds and certain landscapes. Uh, so thank you, Horacio, for introducing me. I'm not going to waste any time talking about myself. So uh, sit back, uh, relax, enjoy the presentation. Uh, we're going to start with basics. Um, in case you don't know where Argentina is, it is right here in the middle of the blue circle. It's this big country down south, second largest country in South America and one of the largest in the world. Um, in terms of population, we've got 45 million people living in Argentina, uh, which places it 31st in the, uh, on the global ranking. So it has, uh, basically means it has the 31st highest population. Uh, but in terms of surface area, 2.78 million kilometers squared, uh, which makes it the eighth largest country in the world. Um, the most interesting statistic here is the population density. As you can see from this map, Uh, large proportions of the country are white and um, white if you can see the key in the top right hand corner white means that there are basically no people living in these areas so the population density of the country as a whole is 16 inhabitants per kilometer squared uh, which ranks it 173rd in the world so what you're essentially looking at is a big country with not that many people in it um, related to its size Um, so that was a little bit on the uh, on the human geography of Argentina. So we now have an idea that it's a big country and there's not a huge amount of people. So now we can look a little more at the physical geography. 
And you don't worry too much about the key in the bottom right hand corner of this image here, because we're going to look at it in more detail during the presentation. But you can start to um, you can start to look at how many colors there are on the map, because each of these colors represents a different eco region. Um, so an eco region is a, a level of of organization, ecologically speaking, and it's something um in terms of definition it's something a bit broader than a habitat and a bit more refined than a bio uh, it's essentially a geographical area with uh, with distinct communities and populations uh, according to the geology of the area and the, the, um, and the well the soil type and the botany uh, so what you're essentially looking at is different groups of um, wildlife and of vegetation that occur in each of these different colored uh, eco regions on the map uh, so there are 15 generally accepted in Argentina these days. So uh, we can deduce from this that high geographical diversity equals high biodiversity. And South America is fortunate to have, um, well, every country in, in South America has got um, phenomenal geographical diversity, uh, which makes it such a popular continent for, for birders, bird watchers and uh, bird tourists alike. Uh, and so while Argentina can't quite compete with some of the, well, with Peru, for example, uh, or Colombia or some of those other northern South American countries, um, according to the latest stats on eBird, Argentina can still boast over 1,000 species that have been recorded uh, within the country. Now, we accept that some of these are vagrants and rarities and um, introductions, both accidental and purposeful, uh, but 1,000 species is nothing to be sniffed at. It's a hell of a lot more than, uh, than, than where I'm from. England can't boast anywhere near as many species as this. So, um, so well, I mean, basically Argentina, yeah, a very rich avian diversity. And it's all down to the high variation of, uh, of, of its eco regions, of which we're going to look at in more detail now. So what I've done here is I've highlighted four areas um, that cover, well, between them, they cover all 15 of the eco regions. And I've tried to place them um, so that you're covering the largest amount of eco regions possible uh, uh, in, a relatively small, um, in a, a relatively small surface area. Uh, because realistically, unless you are loaded, unless you have a lot of money, uh, you're not going to be able to cover the whole country realistically in one trip, uh, which is the one downside. Of, of living in a large country. Um, the benefit, of course, is that you get to come back and do it all again. Uh, so I've put four circles down on this map, and the idea is to focus our attention on each circle in turn, and we have a look at the, uh, the eco-regions that are found within what we could call each itinerary. So we're gonna start off here in the Northeast, and within this first circle, we have eight eco regions. Um, don't worry, don't read them all right now because I'm going to cover each one individually. Um, hopefully, I'm not going to run over time. I know I've only got an hour, uh, so we're going to we're going to jump straight into this. I'm going to start here. Uh, the Atlantic Forest. It, it may not ring many bells to some of you, but hopefully, the image does. Uh, because this is one of Argentina's most uh, recognizable uh, natural features, and it is indeed one of the seven natural wonders of the world. Uh, these are, of course, the Iguazu Falls, um, which, uh, which are found when they are found along the, the, uh, the Iguazu River, and they serve as a natural border between three countries, between Argentina, between Brazil, and also with Paraguay. Um, so when we're when we're looking at the Atlantic Forest within Argentina, we're looking at this relatively small. Uh, I hope you can see it on your screens. We're looking at this relatively small uh, light blue area here in the province of Misiones. So this is where look, it's essentially a landlocked peninsula that juts up um, into. Uh, well, this this white area here is occupied by uh, Paraguay and to the north Brazil. Um, so this little stretch of Argentina is the only part of the country um, that, is, that forms the Atlantic forest ecoregion, um, for which the majority is found in Brazil, uh, found in southeastern Brazil, 
It extends up as far, I believe, as the, um, as the cities of Sao Paulo and Rio de Janeiro. And in Argentina, it occupies just this, uh, this very small um, part of the province of Misiones. Uh, so we're looking at some birds already. You can see them in the image here, flying in front of the waterfalls. I'm sure if you've visited the Iwasu Falls, you know what these are, but for the benefit of those that don't, they are great dusky swifts, and they are uh, pretty much a guarantee when you visit the Iguazu National Park, um, because the well, you can access uh, walking trails and boardwalks that take you alongside or even right over the waterfalls. Uh, and these swifts are regularly seen flying not just over the falls, but also straight through them as well. Because as this photo suggests, um, they are well, they roost and they also nest uh, behind the safety of the falling water. They're quite remarkable little birds, and they're pretty much a guarantee for anyone who takes a visit to the Iguazu uh, National Park. Uh, speaking of the National Park, up here in the top right-hand corner, what I'm going to do for each ecoregion is highlight just a few sites, uh, mostly protected areas, but sometimes other sites of interest that you may want to target on your, on your trip. Um, but of course, you aren't limited to protected areas and national parks and what have you. Here, for example, this image shows just a typical dirt road um, somewhere deep in the province of Misiones, deep in the Atlantic forest, uh, where you can very easily trundle along in your vehicle, not meet another car all day, get out every 100 meters or so, and go and have a look around and see what's going on. Uh, up here, I've got written down as well, hummingbird gardens. Now, these are fairly popular up in the uh, in the Iguazu area in the in the Atlantic forest because well there are plenty of species of hummingbirds there are well over a dozen that you might expect to see uh, if you do if you go for a visit in uh, in one of these special specially set up gardens so here's an image of one this is a Blanalto hermit I'm just going to point out the names are in English because I'm aware that um, the uh, the common names for the species well in in Argentina at least, can be different to those in other parts of South America. So the names are in English for the time being. I hope you can uh, bear with me on that. Uh, so the Planalto hermit is just one of you know, at least a dozen species that you might expect to see uh, on a trip to a typical hummingbird garden. You can see here in the photo an artificial bird feeder. Um, so uh, in terms of, well, in more wild habitats, I mean, we have, uh, there are plenty of species uh, to keep um, the, the most serious or the, the most kind of uh, tranquil of bird is occupied. The green-headed tanager is a real favorite uh, among visitors, well, both for visitors and guides. It's always a highlight. And you can expect to see lots of these colorful uh, tanager and finch-like birds uh, on a day in, uh, in the Atlantic forest. Uh, as well as this here, you get some interesting species also, like this red ruffed fruit crow. This is a species that is also found further north in South America. Um, but this is the Scutatus subspecies, which is, uh, well, this is endemic as a subspecies to the Atlantic forest of Argentina and Brazil. Um, in total in the Atlantic forest, I mean, you can't expect, well, you'd be doing ex extremely well to see so many species in one day. Um, but realistically, if you spent a good amount of time in the forest, um, or at least in, in this part of Argentina, you could look to tally up somewhere uh, well, well in excess of 300 species, potentially even over 400. Uh, certainly within a couple of days, you can expect to see well over 100, and depending on how seriously you take your day of birding, maybe even 200. Um, but rest assured, there'll be plenty of species to be, to be going around then it's just up to you to go out and find them. So the, the Atlantic Forest is an excellent place to start because it offers fairly easy access to, uh, to a, a, a wide array of species. Um, but as we know already, there are 14 other eco-regions and it's only fair that we cover them all with equal enthusiasm. So what we're going to do now is we're going to head on south and we're going to head to a slightly different um, slightly different eco-region. We're now moving into uh, strictly wetland habitats. We're leaving the forest behind and we are going to the Ibarra wetlands, which are, they're a mini Pantanal, if you haven't heard of, of Ibarra. Um, it's a site that is undoubtedly going to be 
become better known as time goes on and as tourism infrastructure increases in the area. Um, I'm quickly going to show you where it is. So hopefully you can see not only the image, but also my mouse, which is going to roughly direct you over here where it says Corrientes. So we're moving southwest from where we were in the Atlantic Forest. And now this teal green area um, is the eco region of the Ibera wetlands. And yeah, as the name suggests, obviously, it's a large wetland site and it's, uh, it's incredibly important for the area. It's one of the largest uh, land, well, landlocked inland wetland sites uh, on the continent. Um, there's a good deal, as you can tell here, of wetland species. So depending on the season, it will attract lots of, uh, what have we got here, wood stalks, uh, roseate spoonbills, great egrets, little egrets, uh, white-faced ibis here as well. Um, and now the, um, I guess the, the safety and security of these birds is now more or less guaranteed by the recent inauguration of the Ibaran National Park, um, which has also been instrumental in a number of um, rewilding and reintroduction projects of not just um, bird species, but also of mammal species. So on your day in Ibera, you may, or you could also expect to see some of the large uh, mammalian species that are typical of Argentina, uh, namely the, um, well, if you're very lucky, a jaguar, but also uh, um, giant anteaters, tapirs and peccaries. Uh, but we're gonna focus on birds for the time being. Um, so we've had some water birds in the background there. We're gonna look at some passerines here because the Ibera wetlands, uh, are also home to some threatened uh, grassland habitats and some that have a precarious status throughout much of Argentina. So it's a bit of a refuge to a lot of species that do not occur anywhere else in the country. So the white-headed marsh tyrants is a very nice uh, wetland associated uh, new world flycatcher. Also here we have the black-capped Donacobius, where Ibera represents the best place in the country to see this bird. Um, and speaking of grassland species, the strange-tailed tyrant is, um, is probably the emblematic species of the Ibera grasslands, the pastisal, uh, and is a firm favourite both among visitors and, uh, and guides. Um, with those long tail streamers, I, I don't think anyone really gets bored of seeing a strange-tailed tyrant. In terms of total species diversity, you're looking at a little bit less than Ibera, than um, Iwasu and then of the Atlantic forest um, because you aren't quite getting the same forested habitat but again over 350 species have been recorded um, and you could tally up uh, quite a nice number in a couple of days work. Quick notes on Ibarat, um, because the national park is quite new um, you could say it's fairly underdeveloped but this I, I imagine for a lot of you would be in uh, advantageous uh, when considering tourism, because you probably won't have to share the national park with too many other people. So my advice would be to get in quickly and pay it a visit before the rest of the world realizes how amazing it is and how much more accessible it is than the Pantanal, and everyone starts going to Ibera as well. So, uh, so yeah, a visit here, highly advisable. And moving on, we move to one of the most important natural landmarks of, um, of not just Argentina, but of Southern South America as a whole. Uh, the Paraná River is the second longest river in South America. It's about uh, 7,000 kilometers uh, from its source up in uh, South Central Brazil. Uh, as it flows down through, uh, well, through Brazil, it straddles the border between Paraguay and Argentina. And then it flows south through Argentina um, before reaching the mouth of, well, it's not the Atlantic Ocean, it actually flows into the Rio de la Plata estuary, um, where in the form of a delta. And the delta is, well, this is a, the delta obviously pictured here. Uh, the delta is one of the fastest growing in the world, um, to the point where if you're familiar with the city of Buenos Aires and you look out over the river and you see and normally you see a lot of brown murky water and perhaps a little glimpse of Uruguay in the distance. Well, the belief is that within the next 50 to 100 years at the current rate of growth, that the, uh, the, the Paraná River Delta will actually start encroaching on the city. 
So those of you who are around in 50 to 100 years, you have that to look forward to. Uh, so the Paraná River, again, as I explained, it's this green slither of, um, of, well, of eco region that flows here. It, um, here it straddles the border between Argentina and Paraguay, as I mentioned, and it flows southwards here and then forming a delta as it, uh, as it flows east and exit out into the estuary. And it's not just purely riverine species that you can expect to see here, because obviously with the delta and islands, you're going to get a variety of habitats. And, uh, and in addition to that, you also get the floodplains. As a, a, most of the land bordering the Paraná River is very lie lowing. So you get these enormous um, extensive wetland systems uh, that are linked to the river. So the Ibera wetlands uh, being one, obviously. Uh, so there's a couple of national parks mentioned up here in the top right hand corner as well that are found right on, on the river. Here we've got some saffron cowled blackbirds in the photo. These are again very important um, species, very emblematic species uh, that are native to uh, uh, grassland regions of, um, of Argentina, also Paraguay and Brazil and Uruguay. And some other species you might expect to see, some that you would more associate with uh, with tropical climates um but the the i guess the riverine habitats of the paraná uh, are closely representative of um oh, well the atlantic forest in our example uh, to allow for species such as guans to to not only occur but also to thrive so the dus the dusky legged guan is a very common species in the lower delta closer to the estuary and occasionally found in the city of Buenos Aires as well. Uh, the red-billed scythe bill is a species of wood creeper that is found further upriver. And then, as you might imagine, the riverine habitats are teeming with, uh, with water birds and wetland associated species. Um, and the thick uh, vegetation of the delta is home to numerous species of rails and crakes, which are uh, typically hard to find as, as they are all over the world. Uh, the rufous sided crake pictured here is one of the more common of the crakes um, in, well, in the whole, in, in Argentina as a whole, I guess. Um, but it's very difficult to see, and the unwitting burden may very well be stood uh, right on top of one and not even realize it um, unless they call. Uh, so they're very secretive birds and require a, a, bit, of, uh, a bit of searching. Um, and because of, well, again, because of the range of habitats, um, not only the, the wetland species that will live more or less on the river, but also your, your floodplain grassland species. Um, the Paraná River, yeah, throughout its length in Argentina, you could accrue over time somewhere north of 300 to 350 species. So we're going to move, and quick, move on and quickly look at a transitional eco-region, the Mesopotamian savanna. I'm going to cover this one a little bit more quickly because, as you can see up here, um, in terms of protected areas, it has either none or some or, or very small protected areas that I'm not aware of. I apologize. And I'm going to quickly show uh, where it occurs here on this previous image. So we're looking here between the Atlantic forest of Misiones and the Ibera wetlands that we've just looked at here. So we're looking up this light blue area here in the northeast. This is typical savanna habitat. And by savanna, we mean grasslands with very low um, veg well, tall vegetation cover. So sparse tree cover, basically. So it's good for grassland species, but ultimately we treat the Mesopotamian savanna more as again, a, a transitional ecoregion that we essentially drive through in order to get to either the wetlands further south or the forest further north. Um, but there are nice species here. So the burrowing owl is, is fairly common throughout much of Argentina. It's a largely terrestrial species that you will see on roadside fence posts throughout, uh, off highways throughout much of the country. Um, it's a, a good spot for migrants as well. So a lot of uh, migrant species will pass through here, including the fork-tailed flycatcher, which will have been arriving to Argentina. Well, they, they should have all arrived by now from further north in South America. 
and here they will spend the austral summit and then also uh, argentina's own wild chicken i guess the giant wood rail is uh, is very common in some parts of northern argentina very often seen uh, at the roadside and it often mingles uh, for whatever reason with um, domestic poultry so keep an eye out for them while you're driving on the northern highways and try not to hit any um, because these are also largely terrestrial and they have a tendency to not fly away when facing danger. Um, they're also the world's largest rail, I believe, um, if you discount the, um, the, the Takahe from New Zealand. And the, the giant wood rail, certainly the largest rail in the Americas. 250 species, again, as I said, we're mostly passing through the savannah. We're looking out of the window to see if we can pick up any of these nice terrestrial species. But it's certainly worth keeping your eye out because of its vicinity to the wetlands, to the south and the forest to the north. Um, there are plenty of birds to see around here. Uh, but we're going to move on now to an altogether more intriguing ecoregion, one that will resonate with a lot of you and, and one that should really be better known around the world. Um, and I'm talking about the chaco, but not just the wet chaco pictured here, also the dry chaco. Um, and the, the difference, I mean, I, I've used photographs to, to highlight the difference. I mean, the, the wet chaco doesn't all, uh, it, it's not always wet, <laughs> but I'm gonna, I'm gonna show you now, um, well, geographically speaking, why one is dry and one is wet. Basically the wet chaco is this blue area here. And as we've seen um, on previous slides, it borders on to the, the Paraná River ecoregion and therefore is part of the, the same floodplain. It's all part of the Rio de la Plata um, basin. And for that reason, it's more habitually flooded. And then the dry chaco, which is found further west, which is this large green area here, um, and is one of the largest ecoregions in the country. And yeah, they're typically defined, or they can be separated by the vegetation type. You see the wet chaco here is more dominated by palm trees. And the dry chaco, well, it's, it's more forested. It's a drier forest. Um, here we have the, the, the Ceiba speciosa, the, um, the Palo Borracho trees. Uh, also a lot of the Argentinian uh, national tree, the, the Ceibo, the Erythrina cristagali uh, also occurs here. And uh, what well, we've seen where the dry chapel is, so we're going to move on. So we, we, we've had a little look at the difference. So the wet chacum, because of its, uh, its vicinity to the Paraná River, um, it's often flooded and therefore it attracts a lot of wetland species and some of the more emblematic species of the country. So the Jabiru stork, for example, one of the tallest birds in, uh, well, in South America as a whole. It stands about a meter and a half tall. Uh, so quite imposing when you see one at ground level. Um, and depending on the season, these can these can form huge flocks in uh, in flooded grasslands. So uh, really a sight to behold. And then from the big to the small, um, teeming with passerines as well. Greenback Beckard is um, is a small uh, is a small passerine species that is strongly associated with um, with riverine forests. And then if you're really lucky, you might stumble across some exciting birds of prey, such as the Chaco Eagle, uh, which is one that eludes me still. Um, it's one of a couple of species of crested eagle that you find in the country. Uh, if you've seen one of these, you've done very well. Uh, another high species count, you're looking at more or less 350 species that occur in this ecoregion. And in terms of the dried Chaco, I mean, it's a similar group of species, but you'll find some that are less associated with, uh, with wetland habitats. So the red-legged Seriema is part of a South American endemic family, one of two species, both of which occur in the dry Chaco. And then down here as well, you have the lark-like uh, brush runner even, which isn't a lark, it's a species of oven bird or funarid. So related to the hornero and the wood creepers and others. And a rogue non-bird that I've thrown in, because I want to point out a bit like I did with Ibera, that the Chaco is an excellent place, probably the best place in the country to view large mammals. 
So the name Chaco itself is derived from the Quechua indigenous language, which roughly translates to hunting land. And this, uh, this gives way to the fact that there, are, there is a rich variety of, uh, of large, um, well, of megafauna uh, that are found in the Chaco. So we're looking at some of the same species as Ibarra, um, the jaguars, pumas, uh, giant anteaters, tapirs, peccaries, skunks, armadillos, um, small well, yeah, you know, smaller species of cats, uh, members of the weasel family. The Chaco's got it all. So if you get bored of the birds, uh, there's plenty to keep you occupied here. Um, it's worth mentioning as well that the Chaco, um, the, the eco region, uh, is not limited to Argentina. It also extends northwards through Paraguay and into uh, southern Brazil and Bolivia, uh, where it borders the Pantanal wetlands. So you get the movement of a lot of the same species that occur in the Pantanal will also occur in the Chaco. And they occur in good numbers too. So again, 350 species more or less. And we more or less covered the Northeast. Now I know we've got three more to go, but we have already, I believe, covered, uh, well, I've covered about half of, the, of all the ecoregions in the country. So now we're gonna move, we're gonna shift from the low-lying East to the Northwest. Um, where you will encounter an altogether different selection of birds and wildlife in general. So here are the, north, the, the eco regions of the Northwest, and we're now gonna have a look at those um, one by one. Now, obviously the Northwest is, is, is defined by the Andes, so the Andes mountain range, which is, um, is a mountain range I'm sure everybody knows. It extends the length of South America, uh, and indeed the, the the, the Cordillera in general um, forms the backbone of the whole American continent. Um, so the Andes, yeah, as I mentioned, I'm going to show on the previous map here. So the high Andean eco region is this green area in northern Argentina, but the Andes themselves stretch all the way from the north in Venezuela down to the very base of Tierra del Fuego here, the very uh, foot of the South American continent. And well, yeah, apart from being a, a biodiverse region, obviously you're going to get some fantastic scenery um, being in the middle of a mountain range. And the great thing is that the roads are of good quality, generally speaking, uh, the highways are very well maintained. So it is possible to move around this Northwestern area uh, fairly easily. So the High Andes, as I pointed out, this green uh, area down here in the West, and the High Andes, uh, this is also where you find the tallest peaks in South America, uh, including that of Mount Aconcagua, which is found, um, I don't know if you can see my mouse, down here in the province of Mendoza. And it stands about, I think, just under 7,000 meters uh, tall. Uh, 6,962, I think, more or less. Anyway, so yeah, fantastic scenery. As I've already said, you get a few nice national parks up here. And lots of national parks that incorporate different eco regions as well. Now, yeah, as Horacio mentioned in the previous hour, the Andean condor is, is of high significance in the, in the whole of South America and uh, Northwestern, or well, Western Argentina in general represents uh, one of the best places to see it on the continent. Uh, not a common bird by any stretch, but if you spend some time in high Andean um, habitats, uh, you're bound to see one at some point. Uh, other species associated with the Andes, the torrent duck, um, which is strictly uh, found along Andean mountain streams, as is also the rufous-throated dipper, uh, which is a small passerine, part of a family that occurs uh, not all over the world, but in different parts of the world. And each species um, emits the same behavior. Um, they are all perfectly willing to dive into fast flowing water uh, where they're able to hold their breath and forage for insects. And they like the great dusky swifts that we looked at at the very beginning are also capable of flying through waterfalls uh, where they often nest uh, beside the shelter of the falling water. 
In terms of species diversity, well, a little bit less in the high Andes than you'll find uh, further east. But do take into account that a lot of these species that occur here uh, will not be found uh, in the east of the country. So in any of the eco regions that we previously looked at, you will not find any of these three, for example. And that's the same for a lot of the birds. Moving on and uh, moving up really to the Puna, which is known as the Altiplano in other countries in South America. And the Puna is defined by, uh, by being really high up. Basically, it's a high elevation ecoregion, high altitude ecoregion. Uh, it averages between three and thousand, four, uh, three to four thousand meters above sea level. Uh, so the air is thin, but the birding is good. The birding is surprisingly good, and you get some really nice species. Uh, again, as with the high Andes, that don't occur anywhere else. So um, we're looking now at this blue uh, area here that is. Um, that mingles, I guess, with the high Andes, um, that moves through, uh, what have we got here? Jujo, the provinces of Jujuy, Salta, Tucumán, down into Catamarca, and La Rioja. And another defining feature of the Puna are salt lakes, such as the Salinas Grandes. They're not all in Bolivia. In Argentina, we have some as well. And then the, uh, the excellent birding location that is the Laguna de los Pozuelos, uh, lake that's found, uh, I think, close to 4,000 4, meters above sea level, where you can see species such as the following. So James's flamingo, one of three species that occur um, in these high altitude wetlands. We've got the Andean avocet as well. Um, and then one of the most targeted species in Argentina uh, from a monotypic uh, genus, the diadem sampi for plover, or Phaeonis micheli. Um, yeah, this is a, a, a real star species of the Andes. Uh, if you've seen one of these, you've done very well because they don't show themselves to everyone. Um, but this is just, again, uh, just an indication that the, the high Andes and the Puna ecoregions uh, really do harbor some of the most exciting species in the country uh, where you can't see them anywhere else. So don't be fooled by the low species total because some of the species you see here are, are, are really quite remarkable and definitely worth the visit. Um, as we move slightly downhill, we encounter uh, cloud forest habitats, so namely the Shungas. So the Shungas aren't limited just to Argentina. These also extend northwards into Bolivia and all the way up into Peru. And obviously cloud forests occur uh, further north as well, so Colombia and Venezuela, well, Ecuador will have its own shung, uh, its own types of cloud forest habitats. The Shungas then we're moving down um, downhill from the from the high Andes, so it's this light green area here bordering the the Andes and the Chaco. And the Shungas, a bit like the Atlantic Forest in the east, is one of the most biodiverse uh, areas of the country. It's very green, it's often very wet, but don't let that put you off. If it wasn't so wet, then you wouldn't get such a nice diversity of species. And you get some really interesting families. So the, the rusty flower piercer, the, uh, the Shunga screech owl, which until recently I think was called the Hoyt screech owl, but it may still be called the Hoyt screech owl. You'll have to refer to your, uh, whichever checklist you follow, uh, which is a, a Shungus endemic, by the way. And then the fulvous headed brush, Finch as well is a really nice Shungas uh, specialist. We're looking at 350 species. It, it's a species tally that rivals that of the Atlantic forest. And I think between the two, you are looking at the most biodiverse areas of the country. So if you can only spend time in one area and you've, all you're focused about is seeing as many birds as possible, um, it really has to be a choice between the two either the Atlantic Forest in Misiones or the Shungas of the Northwest. Um, yeah, to which point we're now going to move south. Uh, just uh, worth mentioning quickly that up here in the Northwest, my circle is smaller than that in the Northeast, because I mean, if you are able to see the detail in the different colors up here in the Northwest, you can see there's a lot of different colors in a very uh, small area. So really within just a couple of hundred kilometers, you could traverse uh, five different ecoregions. So imagine what kind of species list you could end up with 
uh, by doing that. You can visit the High Andes, the Puna and the Shungas all in one day uh, and potentially also get down to visiting one of these eco regions that I've got here marked in the, uh, the centre of Argentina. And we're going to start looking at it straight away. And that's the Monte, which isn't one of the most fashionable eco regions of the country, neither the high Monte nor the low Monte, but they're definitely worth mentioning and of particular significance to birders. So first you're going to show where the Monte is. Here we have the high Monte, there's this pale area here between the Andes and the Chaco, and then this yellow area further down, this large area is the low Monte. And this is where we're transitioning between uh, subtropical Argentina and the temperate region of Patagonia. The Monte is defined by its, um, by its dryness. It's an arid area, receives some of the lowest annual rainfalls of anywhere in Argentina, um, some years less than 100 millimeters annually. Um, but it's a habitat, as I said, important for birders because although Argentina has a fairly low level of endemism, it only has 16 endemic, purely endemic species and five additional breeding endemics, uh, half of those endemic species are actually uh, found in the Monte and almost strictly in the Monte ecoregion. And these, as you're going to be able to tell from the photos, are uh, what we call in England the LBJs, uh, the little brown jobbies. Basically, these are the hard, well, among the hardest birds to identify. Um, and these are some that are going to give you headaches uh, for days. So I urge you to have your camera at the ready when you visit the Monte, because you're probably going to need to be reviewing some of those photos for some time afterwards in order to be able to get the correct identification. That being said, once you have got the correct ID, I mean, there are, there are loads of these little brown birds um, that you could potentially be looking at. So the Sandy Gashita or Galito here on the left-hand side is a, um, a member of the, uh, or is closely related to the Tapaculos and the Wetwets of the Andes. And this is a Monte endemic. Uh, here as well, we have the white-throated Cachalote on the right. Uh, it's part of a South American endemic family um, of only two species, but this being the only one that is purely endemic to Argentina. And if you want the, the typical model of uh, LBJ, then you've got the, uh, the Canisteros. In this case, Steinbach's Canistero, which is endemic to central Argentina. All Canisteros are small. They're all brown. They all make pretty much the same sound. And they're all devilishly difficult to identify. But once you do identify them, there's, uh, there's plenty of them. I think they're in excess of 10 species. So you've got your hands full with the Canisteros. Uh, but once you get used to it, once you start learning their calls, it is good fun. And the Monte, we, we acknowledge that it's a large ecoregion that borders um, other diverse ecoregions such as the Andes and the Chaco. So 200 species is reasonable um, and that can be found within some of these national parks listed above. Moving on quickly, because I'm aware that I'm running out of time, we still have a few more to cover. So we've got the Espinal here. And this, as the name suggests, is spiniferous forest that is found in this gray band here. So uh, it basically um, protects the province of Buenos Aires from, uh, from the effects of the Andes. Um, and the Espinal is predominantly forested. Um, and uh, yeah, so the forest types, they do attract a large number of, uh, of species. And especially with its vicinity to some of the northern wetlands like the, uh, well, like the Esteros del Ibera, the Paraná River, uh, you get a really nice range of, of species. But here we're going to focus on three passerines. So the white-tipped plant cutter is a nice and fairly common one with a peculiar call. The yellow cardinal is a species uh, of concern um, with regards to its conservation within Argentina. It's um, popularly well, it commonly appears uh, as part of the illegal pet trade. So there's a lot of conservation work being done with the species. And then the white mojita as well tends to be um, among the favorites for visitors who visit uh, central and northern Argentina. 
Uh, it's an ethereal uh, New World flycatcher that uh, really stands out against the, the green background. Going to point out as well up here where it says Laguna Marchiquita. So Marchiquita is, well, it's, I think it's the, um, well, it is the largest lake in Argentina. It's the fifth largest um, non-draining lake in the world. Um, and it's, it is saline. So it attracts a lot of, uh, a lot of wetland species. Um, but those that you wouldn't find in, for example, the, um, the subtropical wetlands further north. Uh, so it's an important site for Chilean flamingo, for Wilson's fallow, um, baird sandpiper, and a whole load of other migrants. Uh, and it's in the process of being turned into a national park, which will be called the Ansenusa National Park. Uh, so keep an eye out for that one, because tourism infrastructure is going to go through the roof when a national park is inaugurated there. 250 species, give or take, in the Espinal. Uh, really nice diversity. And behind the Espinal, and uh, a bit close to home in my case, is the Pampa. And the Pampa is strongly synonymous with the province of Buenos Aires. So it's all this area here creeps into Entre Rios and Cordoba and La Pampa, but it's predominantly the whole of the province of Buenos Aires. And the Pampa is defined by grassland. Um, flat, never-ending expanses of grassland um, with the odd uh, uh, tussocks of, um, of hardy uh, vegetation, uh, but with some really nice birding. And because it's low, um, it's low lying grassland, it's very low elevation, it is prone to flooding. And with that, you get a nice array of, uh, of species that can occur in, um, well, several habitats. So New World blackbirds are common, such as the scarlet-headed blackbird here. Southern screamer is, um, is a very popular species for visitors and very common in the Pampas. And the upland sandpiper is one of a variety of shorebirds um, or waders that migrate here for the austral summer and actually stay in the grasslands and are not associated with the coast or with wetland habitats at all. Again, more or less 250 species uh, to get stuck into while you're here. And without further ado, we're going to move south and cover the last two eco regions um, in the area of Patagonia. So, yeah, there are four within the circle, but we've already covered two. So, now we're going to look firstly at the Patagonian steppe. If you've taken a trip with Horacio, you can recognize the car. Uh, here he's parked next to a big flock of Chilean flamingo. And, uh, and a single white wing coot here, I think. We've got horses, we've got sheep. And this little wetlands here really represents an, an oasis and what is an otherwise quite barren landscape. Uh, if, you, if you live in Patagonia, if you drive through Patagonia, you'll know that a lot of it isn't so um, easy on the eye. It's all a bit flat. It can get a bit boring, but you also get some very nice species. And the oases such as these are real highlights because they attract all the local wetland species in the area. So the Patagonian steppe covers this enormous um, expanse of land down south. Uh, here we've got some nice lesser rear or Darwin's rear um, that occur uh, in the steppe. And you get some nice, uh, well, some nice birds of prey such as the Cinereus harrier. Uh, Long-tailed meadowlark is a new world blackbird that's very common in the grasslands. And carbonated Sierra finch is an endemic species to Argentina um, that is a target bird. If you visit uh, this peninsula just here, I hope you can see on my mouse, just um, in the, uh, it looks like it forms part of the Low Monte, but actually it is Patagonian steppe habitat. Uh, and this is also a great place to do a spot of whale watching uh, if you're interested. Southern right whales are around for half the year. So you can combine the two. Uh, that's the carbonated Sierra finch right there. Species totals are low, um, uh, relatively low considering the size of the eco region. Um, but ultimately, it's an easy eco region to combine with the Patagonian forest. And this is where we see some of the most exciting species in Argentina. The forest itself is ancient, uh, similar to the um, to the ancient woodland found in the south, found on the South Island of New Zealand. This is 
of the, the trees are of the Nothophagus genus predominantly, that southern beech. Um, and this is, uh, yeah, like I said, it's ancient woodland and it's very well protected because of its, well, its close proximity to the mountains. It means it's very hard to chop down and it means that the habitat itself has survived really rather well. So it occurs here in central Argentina and moves all, follows the Andes all the way south to the very tip of Tierra del Fuego. Lots of national parks because it's a very popular spot for, uh, for adventure, um, tourism as well. Uh, you've got the glaciers, uh, you've got peaks, you've got glacial lakes. It's a very, um, it's a very aesthetic zone. It's very attractive on the eye. And you get some cracking species like the Magashanic woodpecker, made famous in a David Attenborough documentary, of course. Uh, you've got um, tapaculas and wetwits, like this black-throated wetwit, which is an Andean speciality. And uh, austral parakeets. There's over 30 species of, um, of parrot, parakeet or macaw in Argentina. And uh, this is the most southerly of them all, the austral, uh, commonly seen in Araucaria forest or, uh, or monkey puzzle forest, it's known in English. Only 150 species, okay, but I mean, these are three real target birds that you might not see um, in other eco regions. So uh, the Patagonian forest, highly recommended. And it's forest birding where your camera isn't gonna steam up as well, because there's very little humidity down there in Patagonia. So highly recommended. Uh, Time-wise, yep, yeah, gonna wrap up here. So just these aren't eco regions, but they're definitely worth mentioning. We've got the Atlantic, obviously we've got 4,000 kilometers of coastline um, on, in Argentina. And so you get not only excellent uh, coastal wetland habitats, um, but you also have, uh, well, you've got all the migratory shorebirds and we offer some nice pelagic trips where you can see uh, albatrosses, shearwaters, uh, storm petrel skewers, among others. And not to mention the penguins, um, the uh, mainland penguins, including the Magashanic penguin. And then also on the offshore islands, you'll get some nice, um, nice breeding species there, such as the king and the gentoo. And finally, 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 I know Orasi is getting stressed here. Uh, <laughs> you will undoubtedly um, end up in the city of Buenos Aires at some point. And it is worth mentioning that it is a surprisingly good urban birding destination. Uh, three, over 300 species have been recorded in the Costa Nerosur Eco Ecological Reserve, which is found right in the heart of the city. So my recommendation is that when you do inevitably uh, come to Argentina on the back of this presentation, that you firstly arrive in Buenos Aires. Um, you make sure you have access to this book or any of the various apps that you can download on your smartphone. And you pay a little visit to this reserve to get used to some of not only the common urban species, but also some of the wetland, forest and grassland species that you can find in the rest of the country. Um, so it's thanks from me. Um, or muchas gracias um, to those uh, of the, to the Spanish speakers among you. Uh, I finished with the Rufus Hornero, the national bird of Argentina, and it has been for over a hundred years. And it and myself will be here to greet you when you do inevitably make your way over here. Thank you, Horacio. You can stop worrying. I finished. Any questions? <laughs> Thank you very much. <laughs> Alex, I, 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 will I, can, I can look at the uh, the comments on the Facebook page if you like, and if there are any questions, I can go and answer those um, just straight away on the on the uh, on the Facebook page to save you some time. Okay, si alguien quiere preguntar, la charla quedará puesta eh, en el Facebook, así que las preguntas que quieran incluso hacer posteriormente, eh, Alex va a quedar atento los próximos días para seguir contestando y bueno. Es un canal que ya queda abierto. Así que bueno, muchas gracias Alex, muchas gracias a todos.